Hello and welcome once again to worship here at Lutheran Church of Our Savior as we um, begin our midweek Lenten worship services and as we focus on different people of the places of the Passion. Places of the Passion is our theme that we're looking at on Sundays and looking at the uh, places where Jesus walked and how that impacted um, his ministry, uh, how each of those places did. And then on Wednesdays, we're looking at how there are different people associated with those places or those themes that also help us to um, see what Jesus went through as he went to the cross so that he could open heaven for us. So we're glad that you can worship with us today. I do want to point out, uh, we do have given out these Lenten bags. And uh, for those of you who have them, hopefully you've been working in them a little bit and are prepared. Inside, you will see that we have a Lenten devotional tree, the Lenten tree and activity guide and devotional. There's also a number of other things um, as you were hopefully able to get your tree ready. Uh, today, we're focusing on our first part and it's about love. And so we're gonna be hanging the red heart on our tree today. So if you would, please do that. Someplace. And we'll be doing that each week as we uh, build our Lenten tree and follow the devotions that are inside there. There's a, a, a Bible verse and a, a little thought for you to focus on. Uh, tonight we're visiting someone that um, we know from a couple of different stories in the Bible. We're going to hear from Mary of Bethany. Mary is the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And Jesus is in town. Um, he's on his way to Jerusalem for the Passover. While he's there, those who knew him uh, threw a banquet in his honor. And in the middle of the evening, Mary kind of does this unusual thing. She pours costly perfume on his head. Um, what we're going to try to find out is what was Mary thinking? with this uh, interruption. You know, but we'll find out that directly from her in just a little bit. We do know, however, though, that what Mary did was out of love for Jesus. Um, she had experienced his love and grace and mercy in her life, and she couldn't help but respond in such a loving and generous way. And we're to respond to the love, grace, and mercy that Jesus has for us in much the same way, with love and gratitude for Jesus, in, um, not only in how we respond to him, but in how we, we uh, interact with others. And so our theme verse for this week is, Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive perfume. We prepare for our worship today, um, trusting in the fragrance, beautiful fragrance we have before God because of what God has done for us in our baptism. We begin tonight by remembering that, by remembering how we started all of our days in the Lord in our baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God cares for you, and he cares for me. And he calls us to turn to him, to respond to his love by loving him and loving each other. Too often, though, that's not how we respond. If we're truly honest with ourselves, that is not how we respond. So... As part of the beginning of our worship tonight, let's pause to confess our sins to God our Father. Loving God, we thank you for Mary and the generous act of love and worship she showed 
by anointing you. Forgive us, because too often our giving is nothing like Mary's. Instead of the word give, our sinful nature prefers the word get. Get even. Get back. Get revenge. Get more. Get ahead. Get our way. Get on top. We're consumed with consuming and driven by selfish desires and passionate about more possessions. We're too much like the disciples and too little like Mary. Once again, we ask that you would forgive us and by your Spirit's power, enable us to live and give like her. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Listen to now what our loving, merciful God says. Jesus walked, walked the places of rejection, suffering, torment, and death. And he did that for you and for me. Jesus was determined to go to those places because of his love for you and for me so that we can be at peace because of his great love. Because of that, Jesus forgives us completely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Gospel reading for this evening is from John chapter 12, and it's the account that we read on Sunday, but from uh, that was from Matthew, this one is from John, and it has a few other details. And then we're going to hear from Mary. Our Gospel, starting with verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it. Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. We sing our song of preparation as we get ready to hear from Mary. When Mary poured a rich perfume is the name of our next hymn.
primary either. She was from Magdala. And no, I'm not the sinful woman mentioned in other anointing stories. I've had a hard time shaking that reputation. Truth be told, I'm way too boring for that misnomer. No, I'm Mary from Bethany. Or Mary of Bethany, as I've come to be known. Perhaps you know me best from my siblings. My sister is Martha. Martha is, well, let's just say she's a little bit more talkative than me. My dear sister is a strong, busy type, large and in charge, you might say. But me, I'm a quieter type, more contemplative. You may remember the story about me sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him teaching the disciples. You see, Jesus would often stay with us when he came to Jerusalem. Our little town, Bethany, is just a couple miles east of there. On this one occasion, Martha wasn't happy because I wasn't helping her in the kitchen. It wasn't that I didn't want to help. It was, I was enthralled with what Jesus had to say. There was such wisdom in his words, like unending, deep truths being poured out of an absolute divine being. Anyway, Martha wasn't happy that I wasn't helping. Then she came in and fussed about me to Jesus. She said, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to do all the work myself? Tell her to help me. Well, Jesus told my sister that I had made the right choice. I didn't say anything, but I have to confess that inside I was grinning from ear to ear. So I'm a quieter sister. I'm also known as the emotional one. I suppose that's true. You've probably heard about when Lazarus died. He'd gotten really sick, so Martha and I sent word to Jesus. He could heal people, you know, and we thought for sure Jesus would be able to heal Lazarus if he were there. But Jesus didn't come right away. He chose to stay where he was two more days after he got our message, and Lazarus died. Well, Martha and I did everything you're supposed to do in our culture when someone dies. We closed our brother's eyes. We kissed him one final time. We washed his cold, lifeless body. We anointed him with burial perfume. We wrapped him in burial cloths. We covered his face. Then our friends came to mourn. We walked in front of the procession as the men carried my brother's body to the vault. We watched as they placed him inside and moved the stone to seal the opening. All this to say, my brother was dead. I'll say it again. If Jesus had been there, I know he could have healed my brother. So when Jesus finally made his way to Bethany, four days after Lazarus died, I didn't run out to meet Mark him like Martha did. I don't know why exactly. There were guests in our home at the time, so perhaps that was it. And maybe I wasn't very happy with Jesus, because again, if only he had been there. Anyway, when Martha got home from meeting Jesus outside of town, she told me that Jesus had asked for me. So I went. When I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet, sobbing. You might say I scolded him. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Well, he asked me where we had placed Lazarus' body, as his tears intermingled with mine. If I doubted Jesus' love for my brother, all doubt vanished in those tears. We took Jesus to the place where Lazarus lay, and Jesus asked for the stone to be removed. We were all thinking it, but Martha said it. Lord, he's been dead four days. It's going to stink. But Jesus demanded the stone be rolled away. He looked up into the heaven and prayed. And then he spoke in a loud, booming voice that seemed to rattle the hillside. Lazarus, come out! Now you might find it hard to believe what happened next. I can hardly believe it myself. But my brother, dead for four days, made his way out of the tomb. His hands, his feet, his face bound by the cloth of my sister and I, so meticulously wrapped around him four days earlier. Lazarus was alive. Jesus raised him from the dead. While well, this was so very personal to my family, word of this miracle also spread throughout the village, and all the 
way to Jerusalem and the high priest. People everywhere were starting to believe, like us, that Jesus was the Messiah. The powers that be in Jerusalem had seen Jesus as a nuisance before. Now, though, he was becoming a serious threat. They put a bounty on Jesus' head and planned to kill the Lazarus, you know, hide the evidence. So Jesus and his disciples had to leave town. But a few days before the Passover, Jesus and his friends came back to our house. That's the story that you just heard. Martha, Lazarus, and I decided to throw a party, a feast to celebrate Jesus and what he had done for my brother. Martha served, no surprise there, and my brother, whom I had anointed with nard and wrapped in burial cloths, now sat at the table with Jesus and his disciples, laughing and eating and drinking. I looked at my brother and at Jesus and was overcome with emotion. It was gratitude. It was love. It was, I can't really explain it, but I just knew I had to respond in some extraordinary way to such an extraordinary miracle. All I could think to do, or maybe I was feeling instead of thinking, I went to retrieve the jar that held the burial perfume I purchased after Caiaphas declared his plan to kill Jesus. I know it was expensive, a year's wages for most people, but this was the only thing that seemed fitting to express my enormity of my feelings for this man, this Messiah. So once again, I fell at Jesus' feet and broke open the jar. I took down my hair from the tightly wound bun and wiped Jesus' feet with my hair. The symbolism wasn't lost on Jesus. This was a burial rite, and Jesus knew he would soon be dead. Too many powerful people wanted him gone. I knew it, and so did he. The others? They couldn't bring themselves to admit it. I get it that this act is extravagant, I get that it made people uncomfortable, I do, but I don't regret it, especially given that Jesus defended my actions when Judas suggested that it was wasteful, that the expense of nard could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Some people think that was the straw that broke the camel's back for Judas. If he had been on the cusp between serving Jesus or selling him out, that did it. Jesus rebuked Judas and affirmed me. I wish things had gone differently for him. I'm here today to tell you my story and to ask one question. You see, my act of love and devotion in my home that day was the most fitting, the most appropriate, the most extraordinary demonstration of my love that I could think of in response to the extraordinary love and power of Jesus. So here's my question for you. How will you demonstrate your love for the Lord? I don't imagine it will be wiping his feet with your hair, which might prove to be difficult for some of you these days. But what extraordinary way can you respond to the love, the grace, the mercy, and the forgiveness that each of us have received? Saying you love the Lord is one thing. Showing you love him is quite another. Think of it this way. What's your most treasured possession? Your health, your 401k, your family, your six-pack abs, whatever you treasure the most, maybe that's what you can dedicate to the Lord. Have you ever considered dedicating your family, your health, your retirement savings to the Lord? Lord, I dedicate my family to you. They are yours. Lord, you've given me life in some measure of health. I dedicate my body and health to you. Lord, you have blessed me with a fortune in the bank while well, the vast majority of people have no savings at all. I dedicate my wealth to you. Show me how to break it open and pour it to you. Now remember, Jesus didn't demand this extravagant outpouring of love from me, nor does he demand it from you. It would have had less meaning had it been required. No, this was my choice, my decision, and it was pure joy. Your decision is your own as well. As I leave, allow me to ask once again, how will you demonstrate your love for the Lord?
thank Mary for being here and sharing that message and thank Mary, uh, Maggie for portraying her. You know, Jesus' message, his, his whole mission was to proclaim that the kingdom of God was at hand. It was here. It was among us. That God was acting and fulfilling his promises in him. And unfortunately, the kingdom of God that Jesus brought was much different than what the disciples thought it was going to be, or even the Pharisees, and we see that played out. Um, see, what Mary did uh, challenges us to view, just like Jesus, to view the kingdom of God differently. She shows us that our life in the kingdom of God isn't about our getting. Her story shows us a clear message the message of Jesus that the kingdom of God boils down to one simple word. A powerful, one-syllable, life-changing word. And you and I both know. It's give. God's message for us in Jesus is about giving. Giving lavishly. Giving generously. Giving joyfully and giving completely. And Mary's challenge is for us to try it out. Because when we do, we're going to see that it changes everything in our lives. That it will fill us with so much joy as we, we respond to the love, grace, and mercy that God has shown us with love, grace, and mercy for him and for others. What Jesus did for you and me was amazing. He gave his all for you and for me. And we're left with that question, what can we do in response? How can we live it out among one another? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank and praise you for your great sacrifice. We ask that you would help us to follow in your footsteps, those footsteps which you gave everything out of love. Fill us with faith, hope, and love to do what you ask and to go where you lead. We pray that you would give us generous hearts to give without counting the cost, to share without expecting anything in return, to hold all of our treasures with open hands, to have your priorities that align our life, our love, and our time with your will. Help us to know the freedom that comes with generosity, to give like the Israelites who we read about on Sunday, who continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning, or to give like the Macedonians who urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing to be able to give like Mary, joyfully, exceedingly, and lavishly, to give to you, Jesus, lovingly, faithfully, and abundantly. Heavenly Father, we recall the words of our Savior. I tell you the truth. Wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And so we pray we pray in the name, in the words of the hymn, Take my love, my Lord, I pour. At your feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. These things and all else, Lord, that we need, we place before your throne of grace, trusting in your good and gracious mercy, to supply all things according to your good and gracious will. We ask that it may be so in the name of Jesus and in the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we come towards the end of our worship tonight, we're reminded that too often in our own sinful nature, we're about getting, about getting our own way, about getting for ourselves, about whatever we can accumulate. The kingdom of God is about giving, about giving lavishly as God pours out his love on us and calls us his dearly loved children. Not because what we've done has earned it, not because we are necessary to him, but simply because he is love, and he loves you, and he loves me. And he gives us the opportunities to respond to that love by loving others. And so as we go out, we go in the love of Jesus to love and serve those he puts around us. And as we go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We sing our closing song, A Prophet Woman Broke a Jar.
um, and serve and find out what we're doing on our website, www.lcosrehoboth.org. We're going to continue to bring our Lenten uh, Sunday services as well as our midweek services to you live or uh, here on Facebook and on YouTube. And so you can join us for that. If you would like a Lenten bag, please contact us. Uh, we'd love to be able to get one out to you. It's got a devotional in there along with our Lenten tree activities. We also are opening up our Lord's Covered Food Pantry on Tuesdays for those who are maybe listening and in need. It's open from 9 to 11 and 3 to 5 on Tuesday, at, uh, each Tuesday. So you can either be a blessing through that or be blessed through, through that. Uh, we all are in, um, we all find ourselves in both of those spots at different times in our lives. Those opportunities where we can be a blessing or we're in need of a blessing. And that's what we're all here to be. Uh, to serve one another as we, we seek to follow Jesus until he calls us home. With that in mind, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.